kind thanks go to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring today's episode. Today, amongst other things, I'll explain to you why SpaceX's Super Heavy will maybe never launch from Kennedy Space Center and what SpaceX will have to do differently for their Starship launches. What about it? Go for launch. Or go for launch. Let's light this candle. Ignition sequence start. My name is Felix and I am your host for today's episode of What About It. And as always, there has been a lot going on in the space industry lately, so let's dive right in. Starship Updates So my last episode was over one week ago I had the flu. And when I got to work on today's episode, I realized once again how fast SpaceX actually is progressing with their Starship program. So incredibly much has happened again. It will be hard to stuff only the important topics into today's episode. As always though, I'll try my best to finally bring you up to date again. Let's start with maybe the most visual thing that happened in the past days. The Starship Serial No. 6 150m hop. On September 3rd, four weeks and two days after the first ever Starship hop with Serial No. 5, SpaceX did it again. Starship Serial No. 6, almost identical to Serial No. 5, did its hop as well. SpaceX provided us with some absolutely stunning drone and onboard footage from three separate cameras again. Here we can see Raptor Serial No. 29 work just flawless, lifting the Starship prototype up into the air with a very nice power slide maneuver. The flight path looked very controlled and there were no visible problems at all. If we look back to the Starship Serial No. 5 hop, there were a few things that didn't go as they should have. Minor problems, but problems nonetheless. Something got ripped away from the test stand when Serial No. 5 took off, there was a fire on the engine in flight that didn't seem to affect the performance though, and last but not least, the Starship was slightly tilted after landing. Except for the tilted landing, none of these problems occurred on the Serial No. 6 hop. If we compare the two flights side by side, one thing becomes apparent quickly though. Serial No. 6 and Raptor SN29 stayed up much longer. I'm counting 12 seconds of additional flight time compared to the first hop. SpaceX was much more confident with this second hop. And the Starship did not disappoint at all. Outstanding job by Lab Padre and his team again covering both events. If you've not done so yet, consider becoming a member on his channel to support him and the team further. Looking at Lab Padre's footage up close, we can clearly see the tilted landing again. This is not a problem at all though. The tilted landing is a direct result of the tilted flight path due to the asymmetric thrust. Serial No. 5 and 6 both utilize one Raptor engine. Raptor SN27 on Starship Serial No. 5 and Raptor SN29 on Starship Serial No. 6. Since the thrust puck needs to be developed for three engines though, the Raptors are mounted off-center, resulting in a tilted flight path. What we're seeing at the landing in the end are just the legs adjusting for a tilted Starship. This picture, provided by Carlos Nunes for Space Intelligence, shows the Serial No. 6 legs after workers removed them from the prototype. The left leg in the picture shows how much force they have to take on such a tilted landing. The lower part of the structure is completely crushed. Smooth landings will have to wait until there are starships with three engines. And the engines are progressing fast. SpaceX recently tweeted a picture directly from Hawthorne, California, where they are developing the Raptor, SpaceX's methane-powered full-flow staged combustion cycle engine. It shows the first vacuum variant of the Raptor engine, also known as RVAC. It has a much larger engine bell to accommodate the exhaust expansion in a vacuum environment and it will propel starships forward while they are moving in space. Team Vector! Every Starship will have three sea-level Raptors and three vacuum-optimized engines, as shown in one of Casper Stanley's renders. It will get crowded inside the engine skirt. As of recording the episode, Serial No. 6 has already been lifted onto roll lifts and will likely already be back at the construction site by the time you watch this. But what's next in Boca Chica? Another test tank. Now don't skip ahead, because this one actually is pretty interesting. Let me introduce you to Starship Test Tank Serial No. 7.1. Even if it doesn't look like much, it's a big milestone for the Starship program. Right now, every Starship is made of 301 stainless steel. SpaceX has been planning to change to another alloy for a while now. The only test tank to ever utilize the new 304L stainless steel was the test tank Serial No. 7, which after a short test campaign got tested all the way to destruction and gave a strong indicator for 304L being superior to 301 stainless. 
Musk tweeted after the first test that it went all the way to 7.6 bar and rumor has it that the second test went over the 10 bar mark before it gave in to the pressure. So let's compare 301 and 304 to see what exactly the differences are. The big differences here are carbon, chromium and nickel. 301 has more carbon and less chromium and nickel. This leads to 301 having more tensile strength at room temperature and being much more corrosive. Corrosion is a problem for SpaceX as they are right now building their prototypes directly at the sea and tensile strength at room temperature is not important at all for SpaceX. Starships use cryogenic fuel. 304 might have less tensile strength at room temperature but in return it has more at cryogenic and very high temperatures. Both of which Starships will have to endure during flight and re-entry. Musk has already said that 304 will not be the final alloy as SpaceX will be improving it over time but it's a huge step into the the right direction. Test tank 7.1 is ready for testing, should roll out to the launch site any day now and will be used to get even more test data which will then be directly integrated into serial number 8, 9 and 10. Mauricio from RGV Aerial Photography has done one more of his awesome flybys of the SpaceX Starship construction and launch sites and as always the bird's eye view results in incredible pictures. Check out his Patreon page and consider supporting him for more flight action in the future. Mauricio gives you wings. These pictures were taken prior to the serial number 6 hop, but we can already see a few interesting developments on site again. This one shows the new test stand area just above the tank farm. The new stand is being fleshed out quickly and a lot of thought and work is being put into connecting it to the fuel farm. This makes it more and more unlikely that SpaceX will be moving the entire fuel farm to a different location in the future. Another interesting thing to point out is that the thrust simulator, the three large hydraulic presses mounted under Starships for first pressure tests without an engine mount, has been installed into the new stand. This would make testing much quicker as it takes SpaceX around 10 to 11 hours to uninstall the thrust simulator after use. If a Starship prototype only has to be lifted onto a different stand, half a day can be gained every time a test campaign is done. This adds up quickly, so my guess is that serial number 7.1, the shiny 304 stainless test candidate will be tested here. There's another small concrete foundation right between the two test stands. One possible use case for it would be a crane foundation to lift the prototypes from one stand to the other. This as always is just a speculation though, we'll have to wait and see. Between orbital launch pad and the tank farm at the landing pad area work is continuing as well. A new concrete pad has been poured. As always there is no information on what it will be used for, but there are tons of parts sitting right next to it. The second site with parts closer to the orbital pad is getting more and more filled as well. Lots of fuel pipes can be found here. The connection between orbital pad and fuel farm is still missing and it will be a long one. Finally on today's tour we arrive at the orbital launch pad. It's taken SpaceX a long time to sleeve the rebar pillars with the large metal tubes but they are almost done now. I am probably not the only one in saying that I still can't really imagine what it will look like in the end. On episode 115 I showed a few thought experiments with some possible options but time will have to tell what it really looks like in the end. If you want to go deeper into the subject, episode 115 is linked at the end of this one for your convenience. 4 weeks and 3 days, that's how long it took SpaceX to perform the second Starship hop in human history. This time will drop down to a day if SpaceX's plan works out. Hard to imagine in a world where a few launches per month are considered busy times. But what will SpaceX have to change to achieve this launch cadence? Like the update so far? Then click the like button, subscribe to the channel and maybe even consider becoming a patron to give some vital support. Link is in the description. The team is working relentlessly to provide you with updates twice a week thanks to SpaceX's mind-boggling speed and with your support it will be much easier in the future. Thank you. Starship Offshore Launches there's one radical change needed for Starship and Super Heavy that I have not really covered yet on my episodes. The mandatory need for a new location to launch from. The vast majority of all orbital rocket launches have been performed like this. A land-based launch complex fulfilling the rocket's needs and giving it a safe place to launch from. 
What you're looking at here is the inaugural launch of Falcon Heavy from Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, Florida. There's quite a bit of infrastructure needed for any orbital launch. A hangar for the rocket to be stored until launch day, a fuel farm to fill the rocket before launch, a launch support structure holding the rocket up before ignition, a flame diverter and a deluge system to mitigate heat damage and reduce noise levels. And in SpaceX's case, a landing pad to get the booster down again. And this part most of the time is done with a boat. Anyone who's ever watched a SpaceX launch before knows these pictures. The booster lands again downrange on the ocean after it has delivered the upper stage into space. This is a Saturn V launch, same pad just a few decades before. Nothing changed much in these past decades. The rocket launched from Pad 39A and this is the most powerful rocket ever launched at the site. 35 mega newtons of thrust blasting down into the flame trench. An incredible force. People had to stay clear from the site for miles around to not get killed by its sound alone. What happens though if you launch a SpaceX Super Heavy? Its thrust output of roughly 74 mega newtons of thrust will be far greater than anything we've ever seen in the history of rocket flight. So Starship and Super Heavy launches will mostly be done offshore. Not in any way as we're used to seeing rocket launches. No viewing galleys, no jetty park to watch the booster land and maybe most importantly for those into the tradition of rockets, no Kennedy Space Center. There will not be enough clearance around any of the launch complexes in Florida. Musk is talking about 30 kilometers of safety zone around a Super Heavy launch due to hazardous noise levels. So this is Kennedy Space Center, Florida with the surrounding area. Titusville, Coco, Rockledge, the KSC facilities, Port Canaveral, the list goes on. And this is the exclusion zone a super heavy launch would need according to Elon Musk. Get the idea? For every single launch and SpaceX wants to do three per day or more, the whole area would need to be evacuated every time a launch is conducted. This obviously is impossible, so SpaceX is looking for ways to circumvent this problem. There's basically just one option here. Find a spot where there just isn't anything around. This would simply be impossible down the whole east coast on land though. So once Starship is fully operational, SpaceX will have to move 99% of their launch activity out to the sea. Offshore launches will be the new thing when it comes to Starships. For today's episode, Nick and I put our heads together to come up with a possible visualization on how this might work. I know it doesn't look like the official SpaceX animations we've seen so far, but there are good reasons and looking at you, evil water tower, it wouldn't be the first time SpaceX doesn't stick to what they showed in their animation. There are a few vital parts missing and we took the liberty of adding them. So let's imagine this is what it will look like and we have a Starship and Super Heavy ready on the pad for a launch. At sea there is nothing around it except for the pad itself and an exclusion zone is easily set up. So off we go. After delivering the Starship to orbit, the booster returns in a very similar fashion to how a Falcon 9 booster returns from orbit. And we have touchdown. The mobile crane can just pick up the booster and set it down on the mount for refueling. And here comes our Starship. ISS is now double the size after three construction flights in one day. Well done, mission accomplished. And out comes the mobile crane again picking up the slightly off-center Starship. Lifting it up all the way to a stacking height and changing its orientation. Setting it down on the booster and holding it in place with the support structure. Done. What do you think? Is this what it might look like? Do you have any ideas to add to it? As always, tell me in the comments and make sure to subscribe to my Twitter at Felix Schlang to be part of the ongoing discussion. This is part one of my offshore launch pad analysis as there is just too much to cover for one episode. Look forward to part two on Friday's episode for an in-depth look at what facilities the offshore pad would need and how SpaceX might find surprisingly easy ways to build it. It all comes down to security for everyone involved. We talk a lot about the astronauts and how they need a safe trip to space where there have been a lot of casualties amongst ground personnel throughout the history of spaceflight. Security needs to be provided for everyone and today's sponsor might be able to help you with your own security needs. Whether it's data and identity theft, traceability, intrusive advertising or geoblocking. You've likely made contact with some or all of them before. 
Almost everyone can tell a personal story and most of the time you're aware of the danger when it's already too late. Surfshark VPN encrypts your data and turns you into a harder target for attackers to get you and tough targets are skipped in favor for weaker ones. Or have you ever been greeted with a message that this site or video is not available in your country? Streaming services like Netflix or Disney Plus for example have vastly different libraries in different countries. What a bummer! Surfshark makes you outsmart them easily by removing the so-called geoblock from your account. Just activate your VPN, change your virtual location, refresh the page and you're good to go for countless more Netflix and chill evenings. I use Surfshark every day. It automatically starts up whenever I start my PC and whenever I need it, I activate it with just one click. Use my code to get 85% off plus 3 extra months for free and at the same time support what about it. Hurry, as Surfshark is changing the deal to 83% off by tomorrow, September 9th. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is no risk. Surf with your own set of rules. Links in the description. And we're at a very important part of the show again, the Patreon and YouTube member shoutout. This is where I take the time to honor those who make all this possible in the first place. Today's shout goes to Keith Kuhn, Mark, Paul E. Redfern, David May, Uriah Light, Michael Eichner, Andy Green and many others. You rock! Especially in times when I'm so sick that I can't even produce an episode. The value of what you are doing for me shines over everything. You are amazing. Thank you. Last but certainly not least, the finish belongs to my team. You've basically kept the community going while I couldn't do it. You're already organizing my 100k livestream and I'm filled with awe. Thank you all so much for helping me move this mountain forward. We're accomplishing something here I would have never been able to do alone. You rock. Starship serial number 6. Sex. Hmm. There we go. We're back in the groove. We compare the two flights side by side, one thing apparently becomes quickly. <laughs> ending. Yeah. It will get crowded inside the engine skirt. We already be back at skip a little I'm a scat man.